All righty. Welcome to our um, Beverly School Committee meeting of the whole. And this is our second of our three candidate interviews tonight. Um, first thing on our agenda is uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So the flag is behind me, lit up outside. And Mr. Goodwin, will you lead us in the pledge, please? Of course. I pledge of allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, it looks nice out there with the snow. All right, thank you. Um, so welcome everybody, and welcome Dr. Trocek. I hope you enjoyed your tour through wonderful Beverly today. I don't think and I could find a better way to spend my day, so it was awesome. Nice. Um, I guess just to be consistent, we'll go around and introduce ourselves. We are hey. the Beverly School Committee, and we'll start on my left with John Belady. Oh yeah, please put your microphones on. <laughs> Hello, I'm John Mulady. I represent Ward 4 in the school committee. Hi, I'm Rachel Abel. I represent Ward 1, and I have a fourth and a fifth grade student in our district. Hi, I'm Mike Cahill. I'm the mayor and a member of the school committee. Paul Goodwin from Ward 5, and I have two products of the Beverly School System in college right now. And I'm Chris Silverstein, the chair of the school committee. I have two graduates of Beverly Public Schools, and I represent Ward 3. And Kelly Ferretti, Ward 2 representative, and I have four children proudly representing Beverly in grades 3, 4, 7, and 8. Linda Visnick, Ward 6. I have two graduates of the Beverly Public School System. I have a high school senior about to walk across the stage and get his diploma. Very exciting. And an 8th grader here in the new beautiful middle school. I'm Stephanie Foster. I'm the recording secretary, and I work in the business office. So just a reminder for everybody, uh, though these interviews are public, members of the public are welcome to be here, but there's not an opportunity for public comment or questions here. I hope if you went to the, f to the previous forum with Dr. Turocek, you um, had a chance to ask questions there. And there will be feedback forms after this session if you would like to give us any feedback on your thoughts um, about this interview tonight. And I also want to thank BevCam once again for, for taping. Uh, they're taping all of the interviews, and they'll have them available hopefully by the end of this week, if not the very beginning of next week, so that um, you know people who can't be sitting here can kind of um, watch them as well. And people at home um, who might be watching can feel free to email me with thoughts and feedback if you want me to share that with the school committee as well. So, Dr. Trocek, thank you again um, for your interest in your position and this, uh, your interest in the position. And we know it's been a long day for you, but really not a long day for you because it's a normal Wednesday for all of us. But um, we're at school committee. <laughs> yeah. So we hope that you f found it as informational and um, and rewarding as we had hoped to set it up for you. We have heard and seen lots of wonderful things about you in your previous work with us and or your current work with us and through your resume and, and um, cover letter and, and so forth. But tonight we'd like to get to know you a little better. We have a total of 15 questions. Um, so that's one for, that's two from each school committee member. And we'd just like to engage in a dialogue with you about what your thoughts are about the future leadership of our district. 15 is a lot of questions, so it gives you like three to five three to four minutes per question. Um, at question number eight, I'll stop us and give us a time check so we can kind of gauge where we're at. And um, so um, to start with, we have read the information that you provided in your application. And could you tell us briefly why Beverly? And um, then maybe share with us some of your perceptions of some insights you came away with today from your visit to the district. And were there any surprises? All right, thank you. Well, um, I, I know that um, all of you know me, and I know that uh, many of the people in the audience know me too. But um, briefly, I'm in Beverly. Um, I've been in Beverly for the past 23 years. I've served in this community as a teacher. I've served as a team chairperson, and I've been a principal um, of the Air School for 10 years. Um, and for the past five years, I've been the assistant superintendent. Um, Beverly is a community uh, that 
that anyone would want to work in. Um, I think we are a forerunner in what we do. We take uh, our education seriously. We look very closely at what we need to do to meet the needs of students in Beverly. And um, I've been a part of that journey all the way through. So um, my, I, I'm honored and humbled at the ability to be here to interview with you tonight and for your consideration for the position. And um, I'm looking forward to, to answering questions as you have them as we go. Um, my day today was amazing. I had the opportunity to um, be escorted around and dropped off at the door, which I don't usually get. <laughs> um, and, and I visited classrooms in, in four of our schools. Um, you ask about something that struck me. I had um, the unique opportunity to sit with the students at Beverly High School. Um, and, and boy, are they amazing. And um, the questions that they asked and the insights that they have um, and the the investment that they have in their own education and in the educational system in Beverly was, was really striking. Um, I'm, I'm very familiar and, and every time I go in our classrooms, I'm uh, thrilled to see the work that our students and our teachers are doing at the innovative practices that are in place. Um, and at the ability for our building leaders to do what they do in their buildings. So um, it was a great day. I enjoyed it tremendously and um, be happy to do it again anytime. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Milady. Hi. Uh, congratulations on being a finalist. Thank you. Um, so my question is a two-parter, and just a heads up, there's a couple of others who have two-parters as well. So the first part of my question is, if you were to have a 360-degree review, how would those you manage describe you? And then the second part is, how would those that manage you describe you? Thank you. Oh, OK, that's a great one. Didn't see that one coming. All right, um, I love 360 degree reviews. Actually, I was having a conversation with the leadership earlier this week about um, how we could look at our formatives as we go forward and be able to provide reciprocal feedback to each other. Um, how those that I manage would describe me, I think um, they would describe me as energetic, um, as passionate, as knowledgeable, probably exhausting at some level. Um, um, the work that we do together, I think we enter into in a collaborative nature. I think they know that uh, as their either evaluator, supervisor, a colleague, that I'm there to kind of look deeply and reflect deeply at the work that we do together, um, to have conversations about how we can improve because there's always room for improvement in everything that we do. Um, I think they would probably describe me as tenacious because sometimes when I get an idea, I have a little trouble letting go of it until I hear nine good reasons why it might not work. Um, but I, I also think that they would describe me as someone who um, they can predict as I walk in the room that whatever decision gets made, it's going to be made in the best interest of kids in our district. Um, and I, I weigh uh, very carefully and I reflect very carefully on how we make decisions and what we do. So um, I, I believe that's how they would describe me. I hope that's how they would describe me. How would the person who supervises me, he might tell you that I'm exhausting. <laughs> um, I have entered into a number of very strong discussions with him. I'm, I'm uh, very honest with him. I come forth and tell him what I believe in, my beliefs I wear on my shoulder. I don't think anyone would ever question what my belief system is. What I say is what I believe and what I do demonstrates what I believe in. Um, I'm not easy to sway when I have an idea in my head, but I'm also reasonable. And um, I'm also always, always looking to learn more. So um, there's, th there's not a, a, a scenario or a discussion or a conversation that I'm not looking what I can learn from this conversation, what I can take away from it, and then how can I generalize that into some of the other things that I do. So I, I think that would be it. Yeah. Thank you. Mrs. Fisnick. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Dr. Chirokchik, can you please describe for us what you have done in your current role to address the growing social, emotional, and behavioral needs of all students? In particular, um, where have you seen successes and what have been the challenges? Awesome. Yes, uh, you know, um, 
in my current role as assistant superintendent, I'm working closely with the principals around the curriculums that we have in place. Um, I think that um, for three years, we have been grappling with what is the best way for us to approach the, the sort of changing landscape around social emotional learning in our schools. Um, and, and I think we've settled perhaps on a really good framework for social emotional learning. Um, we took a very close look at a number of frameworks and, and uh, are in the process of adopting the CASEL framework, which is really built on five social competencies. So the work that we're doing together is really now what are the five social competencies and what do they look like? So what does it look like to be self-aware as a seven-year-old in our elementary schools or as a 12-year-old in our middle school or as a 16-year-old in our high school? So each one of those social competencies, unpacking them. And then if in fact this is what we believe our students need to master, how are we measuring that and where are those measurements? And you know, currently on our elementary report card, we have a lovely profile of social uh, competencies that we talk about. And when we get to the middle school, those disappear. There's not a really strong measure that we get on how are we doing with social emotional competencies in the middle or in the high school. Those are discussions and conversations that we're in. I think we're looking closely at our rubric. So what is the rubric that sit behind those social competencies and how are we going to measure them and how are we going to prepare our teachers? And if we really believe that these social competencies are necessary for success throughout your schooling years and beyond in college and career ready, where are we in, where are we infusing the explicit instruction around those? Does it fall on, uh, does it land on the health teachers? Does it land in the classroom teachers? Or really is it everybody's responsibility? And if it is, how do we build some of that collective responsibility around teaching those uh, competencies? So um, it's a really, really important topic. Um, I think our successes are very strong in our younger years, in our younger grades. Um, it's easier. You have a teacher who's responsible for 22 students, so it makes it easy. You know, in the high school level, it's different. You have 100, you see 125 students a day. Um, and we all know and we believe that social emotional learning, the basis of it all is having really good relationships with teachers. Um, so that becomes a bigger challenge when you have more students that are sitting in front of you. So how do we um, do that? In terms of successes, our uh, elementary schools have very strong curriculum. Um, they, have, they, they build on the foundation of the response of classroom philosophies. They utilize curriculums in second steps, steps to respect, and they've really begun working too on some of the um, zones of regulation which are, are, are taking hold in our classroom. So I think they have a pretty strong handle on what they're doing in terms of our core tier one social emotional learning competencies. Um, where I think we have a lot more work to do, and, and, I, and I do um, believe that there's a lot of work to be done, is at our secondary level and looking um, particularly at our middle school. So developmentally, Adolescent development is, is something that you know takes a lot of work and, and it is different. You can't just apply the same concepts that you apply in elementary school to the middle school or to the high school. So I think that's where our greatest work lies. Um, I, I worked together with a team. There's a team that we're creating, the Climate Committee, um, utilizing some of our funding from the ECLC grant. That's a teacher, um, multi-stakeholders, teachers, administrators, parents. We're looking to pull all of those together. Um, um, within the school adjustment counseling staff here at the middle school. I've been working very closely. They're the ones that actually um, ha have uh, looked closely at CASEL and what it can do for us if we were to try to operationalize it as explicit instruction in our school. So that they're, they're looking at it, they're developing some curriculum, they're working independently right now, going into classrooms, teaching lessons on zones of regulation and talking about self-regulation. Um, but by no means are we where we need to be. I think that's an area that we need to really continue to grow in. So that's an area that I would be working on. All right. So we're definitely, um, as Chris said, as Madam President said, we're um, trying to regulate each answer. So uh, I do have a short follow-up for you. Mm -hmm. If we could try to be quick about it. Uh, yes. So you said that we've been doing this for about three years, but there's still much more work to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you have any concept of a number of years, mm -hmm. a number answer, it's, almost it's like a, a yes question. or no. Yeah, no How much longer until we can roll something out in our middle and our high schools? Yeah. 
so I believe that the, com the, the climate committee will emerge from their meetings probably by the end of June with some real specifics around the competencies and what they look like and how we'll measure them. So the implementation would begin in the fall of 19. That's our goal. Um, that's the work that they'll be charged with. But it is a, uh, um, the, we have a grant that brings us through into uh, the 1920 school year. Um, Fantastic, thank you. Yep. Okay, Mayor Cahill, you're up. Thank you, Madam President. Dr. Trochik, good to see you. Um, here's the question, uh, the next question. Given the cyclical nature of the economy, it is entirely possible that a more difficult winner Turn on the microphone, sorry about that. Given the cyclical nature of the economy, it is entirely possible that a more difficult economic time may come to pass during our next superintendent's tenure. Please explain how you would help guide the Beverly Public School District through such a time. Thank you. Actually, we spent a lot of time in our parent forum addressing the same question. Um, uh, you know, I think it's important when we think about budgets and when we think about how we develop them and how we, uh, how we move forward that we not think of budgets as a one-time annual opportunity to take a look at numbers and decide what we need to spend in the coming year. That always that budget process is about a multi-year um, vision and what, uh, what taking stock of what, where are we in the scope of time and how do we, ma how do we manage that. Um, I've watched closely Brian Ailes and his, uh, and, and I've learned from him as he's done his presentations around how we are, what other, what factors enter into it, whether it's debt, whether it's some of those other things. Um, in terms of the school budget, I think we have, uh, uh, we're, we're responsible for taking a close look at all of our priorities. What are the competing priorities that exist and how do we make decisions? I will tell you first and foremost that any, budget that I would be proposing even in difficult times would start by looking at what do we need in our classrooms and how do we make sure that what goes on in the classroom level is meeting the needs of the students that are in there around staffing, around provisioning, making sure that what we need to uh, implement the, the learning within the classrooms is there. That's the starting point. Um, Collecting information about the priorities of all of the stakeholders in the community is a really important part of the process. We have created a district improvement plan that uh, that a lot that lies lays out our vision and our goals for the next three years while we're in the entering into the second year, but we're, we, we spent a lot of time visioning and working and reflecting on what is that we want and what do we need to do to get there. So we have a document that is the district improvement plan that drives some of that. Off of that district improvement plan, the principals engage stakeholders at their building level with their school councils, which have community members and parent representatives, um, and at some levels, I think even student representatives. And they, in turn, building off the district goals, build their school goals, and they identify what are the priorities, what are their needs, what do they need to have to move forward? Um, so I, I think that both of those documents would be driving documents around some of the work. Every year we come together as a, with the school committee and we outline what are the priorities that the school committee has, what are the areas that they feel like need to be addressed. Those are important things to do on a regular basis in a good budget cycle. I think in a challenging budget cycle, those things become even more important. Um, and, and, and working together to identify what do we need to do and how can we best meet, meet the needs of the students through the lens of the priorities that are set by the school committee, by the leadership, and um, by the, the individual building leaders. So um, that would be a process that I would look at. Those are the strategies that I would implement. Um, there's so much more that comes into play when you're thinking about cr drafting and creating a budget. Um, where are we in terms of negotiation with the union? What kinds of contract obligations do we have outside of that? What capital expenses might we be facing? Um, what, how are we doing with uh, state where is the state in terms of funding? Is there changes or shifts that are happening in terms of state funding? So those are all important factors that you have to consider. Um, you know, um, I, I think that's the starting. That, that would be the process that I would look at. And I think that process would be even more important, as I said, if there was a challenging budget cycle. Yeah. OK, me next. Um, so special education is a challenge because of the complexity of rules and the service needs and the student and parent concerns. When you assess the effectiveness of a special ed program, what are you looking for? So 
So that's a great question. So I think, um, and I might have stated this somewhere before, so I forgive me if I'm repeating myself. Um, I think that special education um, as a whole has to, we, we kind of might need to be rethinking how we look at special education. For a long time in Beverly, we've looked at special education as, as entering on a parallel path with what we do with regular education. And we've done great things in our regular education area, looking at data meetings, utilizing data, assessing, you know, setting up different kinds of structures to intervene and to create some tiered interventions for students um, trying to meet their needs. We have to make sure that within, sp within special education that we have a, a similar vision, that we take a look at data, that we're careful to um, determine is this effective. I think we um, want to make sure that when, you, when, when you're working within special education and you design some specially designed instruction, which is something different than we normally do, you have to make sure that you're going in and progress monitoring and looking for the efficacy of that. Is it working? Does it need to be changed? Does it need to be more fre frequent? Does it need to be in a smaller group size? Those are all decisions that we would make within a special education um, decision-making data meeting. Um, in terms of programming, um, I work very closely with Bethany, um, and, and when we think about our why we have in-district programs, we have our in-district programs because we want to make sure that we can meet the needs of students in Beverly, in our Beverly schools. We look very closely at how we do that in sort of in a continuum. So our first goal is always to kind of meet a student's need in the least restrictive environment, finding a way to make sure that we're providing the services in a way that students are making progress. It's only kind of after we've tried all of those things that we would think about putting them in a program. Um, but our programs are there for a purpose and they serve a really, uh, a really important um, need to keep our students in Beverly, to keep them in our Beverly schools, and we do everything that we can to do that. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, Mrs. Abel. Sure. Um, how would you develop a strategy um, of improvement for the district to ensure that it addresses the priorities of the district, and if possible, could you give an example of a framework or a strategy that you've employed to support that? Um, yes, I think, you know, there's a very um, important process when we think about um, making a change, right, or, or, or implementing a new idea or a new strategy. Um, I think you have to first start by uh, hearing from the stakeholders and really looking at what is the actual problem of practice that we're looking at. So priorities can come from a lot of places. A priority can be uh, some some ideas about free full day kindergarten that we talked about earlier. It can be uh, making sure that we have small class sizes. It can mean that we're looking to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our learners in the best way possible. So um, when you do that, you have to start with the collection of data. What does the data tell us that needs to happen? What Are we looking at the problem, and is the problem that we're looking at really the problem and the solution as we come up with a solution? So there's a cycle, plan, do, uh, look, act, right? So we're, we're really working on a cycle of making sure that as we try something, is it working? Do we need to refine it? Do we need to go back and try something differently? So I think I, um, I would love to use as an example of a strategy, uh, we, uh, as a uh, leadership team and it was a, a, a real um, situation that we found through examining the data that we had students in Beverly who were being educated in some separate settings um, when and, and the data wasn't showing us that that was working, right? So not only, we, we looked at the state data, we were exceeding the number of students that were in sub-separate settings for us in the district and that would have been good if we were exceeding our expectations and they were mastering and that wasn't the case. So that was a problem of practice that we had to address. So we brought together stakeholders. Uh, this process began about two years ago. We had teachers that were teaching special education. We had regular education. We had elementary, middle school, and high school administrators in the room. And we tried to peel it apart. Why is this? Why do we think this is happening? Um, we sat together and, and sort of peeled it back and first came up with, well, uh, perhaps that the, perhaps they need a different kind of instruction or perhaps they need a content instructor. So what we're doing is we're taking students who are learning, have learning differences out of a math class and sending them to a teacher who may have be a special education teacher but not math certified 
to teach them math. And so that, that was a problem. It wasn't working for us. Um, we took a look at the resources that we had available. We tried to narrow the problem down so that we could, for a year, try something different and see if it would work. We set up a pilot program in grade six where we, we after looking at the resources that we had, the students that needed the work, we set it up so that we were doing uh, an inclusion model for them in their core content areas with a special education teacher and a teacher and a co-teaching model. And we tracked that data over the course of the year to see if it worked quarter, mid-year, three-quarter. After being able to take a look at the data and seeing that we saw improvement, we made the decision to scale that. So we scaled it down a grade and up a grade. So purposefully making sure that we could manage what we're doing so that we could collect the data and look at what was going on all along. So I mean, I think that's when I think about a change strategy, how we do it. That's an example of how we do it. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, Mr. Goodwin. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Shorchek. As superintendent, how would you work to recruit and retain excellent educators to the Beverly Public Schools? That's a great question. Okay. Um, I think that um, that's hiring is one of the top priorities for us. What, that's what we need to do. The teachers that stand in front of our students in the classroom and run our classrooms are, are our most important commodity. So how are we making sure that we are getting teachers that are prepared and that we can help work with um, to do the work that needs to be done in the classrooms. Um, we've actually have a few things in place I think that has been very beneficial to us. We've uh, taken advantage of it. We've partnered with Endicott College in terms of fellows and in each one of our um, elementary schools. A fellow is a fifth year student so they've graduated, they're undergraduate, they're certified teachers usually at the end of that and they enter into a year-long fellowship in order to get their master's degree in either reading or special education or English language learners. Um, this partnership that we have with them avails them. We, at, at the, the contribution from Beverly is the cost of the tuition for that one year program. And in return, they work for us full time in our schools. Uh, that allows us to kind of enculturate them. We get an opportunity to see how they are and what they're doing and what their work ethic and do they understand the way that we're doing business. Um, so that's been a really um, great opportunity for us to kind of bring teachers into into our schools and make sure that that they are on board and share the vision and goals that we have for teaching and learning um, that being said I think that there are, um, are other opportunities that it would be nice for us to be able to expand upon um, I think in particular we have a, a pretty um, singular, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, uh, makeup of our teaching force, largely white female in our elementaries. And, and um, so uh, I think it's an important thing as we grow that we would love to have our faculty be re more representative of the student body that they're teaching. Looking at ways to kind of enhance and recruit teachers of color or um, some of those things that might uh, offer us a little more diversity in our teaching force is something that um, is really important. There are recruitment fairs that are out, uh, that are available. Um, I think a challenge for us is, uh, for and for those teachers, is how competitive we can be in the market in terms of our salary scale and some of those things. So um, I think that those are just a couple of ideas that I have in terms of hiring. And, and I think the same goes for administrators. I think it's really important that we think about uh, retaining and hiring strong administrators. And to that end, we're in a partnership with Salem State um, where uh, we have, uh, this year we have five, I think five or six teachers in a cohort that are attending a CAGS program for educational leadership. Um, trying to grow within our own ranks, the future teacher leaders, take grabbing teacher leaders and trying to make sure that we have a pool of, uh, of, of ready for administration teachers in our pool so that when we have openings, we have uh, people to select from, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And Mrs. Freddy. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Trocek. Um This question is a little different than the others we've had. Uh, it's what is the best mistake you've ever made? And by that, I mean a choice, a decision, something you implemented that it quickly became apparent was not the best selection. And how did you handle it from, from that point on? And I, I'll give you an example. What comes to mind for me, I, 
I at one time bought a, a grill and mm -hmm. I, I bought a, a natural <laughs> gas grill and we, my husband assembled it halfway through and screamed, it's not propane, it's natural <laughs> gas. And you bring so, back to the store, I hope. Yeah, <laughs> and, and at that point, you know, we had a decision and what we did was run gas. And, and I look back and that was one of the best mistakes I ever made. <laughs> but, uh, well, I, I have an example. I, I don't think it's going to be exactly what you're asking, but I think it's representative of how we can, uh, we, we call it fail forward. That's our new phrase that we like to use. How can we fail forward and learn from our mistakes? Um, and I think actually, um, because I, I think my, my challenge with it is I didn't quickly, it wasn't a quick change. It's something that has evolved over time. Um, and I think in addition, not only as it being my, when I, I would call it a mistake, I would also call it one of my greatest successes. So there's kind of two ways to look at this. Okay. Um, I believe it was probably in 2006, 2007, I was the principal of the air school. And um, we had a label that was not too attractive called a school in need of improvement. And we decided that that, you know, that wasn't good enough for us. So we had to make some decisions about how we would, how we would uh, change that. What would we do differently? Um, we, were, we had the opportunity to partner with a, a great partner that has been a partner for Beverly for years in Bay State Reading Institute. Um, and they brought into us a whole new way of thinking about teaching and learning. And it was very data driven and very much involved in RTI model. And, and we, you know, we were hitting on all cylinders. Every child, you know, was going to learn to read and they were going to learn early numeracy in our school. We were dead set on that. And so uh, with a vengeance, we went after that. We set up tiered instruction. We had kids in intervention. We moved them in and out of classes. And uh, lo and behold, the achievement improved. We achieved a level one status. It was a great success. In reflection, however, I think some of the mistakes that we made in that process um, or that we did it... Um, Two words come to mind, neither of them are very attractive, but one in a colorblind way, right? We did not honor the culture or the backgrounds or the students that were there. We had set our expectations and <coughs> how they were going to learn, and they were going to come hell or high water, they were going to learn how to read and write. Um, so, so that was a mistake. And the second mistake is that we did that in what they call two subject narrowing, right? We said, not going to worry about science, not going to worry about social studies, we're going to teach them to read, we're going to teach them to do math. Right? And lo and behold, they learned to read and they learned to do math. But we had you know, a whole cohort of students who went through <coughs> without exposure to some of the social studies and some of the science that was out there. That really, um, that, that, and, and I'm not going to own this problem all to myself. I, that was a trend in education at the time. I think for many districts around us, they might still be doing, un, operating under that kind of model. Um, for me, I think what I learned from that is that we need to really um, do a better job at looking at the whole child and looking at core knowledge and how does core knowledge play into a child's development as they grow. So uh, in terms of changes for that, I think that's where um, a lot of my, my drive comes right now as we take a look at personalized learning, as we take a look at project-based learning, as we look at cross uh, discipline um, into disciplinary units um, because I don't I think we have to be careful um, not to ignore and, and at the risk of other knowledge go forward just to and, and I would say that the driving force was to pass MCAS I mean MCAS was a state mandated assessment and we said we need to do better we need to score well on this test so a lot of the work that we were doing was all in quest of doing well on a single test and I think um, we have a much broader understanding of how we might measure success and achievement and what our goals for kids are as they um, go through our school system and as they leave our schools. Um, so um, I think uh, the flip side of that too is I think we neglected to take a really close look at the value that the culture we were a very diverse school at the time all English language learners were at our building. Um, it, it made us great. It made, a, it made for a wonderful school environment. Um, but I think we could have done a better job developing some um, cultural proficiency and, and honoring and, and valuing some of the cultures that were in our building. And we could, we could have, I think other kids could have benefited from knowing more about the students that they sat next to. So, so I think those are the lessons that I learned from that. Yeah. And, I don't know. That. No, that's great. That sounds like a gas grill. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> not quite a gas grill. Not as quick as a gas that's grill. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Malady. Thank you very much. 
So currently Beverly does not have a free full day kindergarten. And what is your personal opinion on communities providing this service to its residents? And the follow up is, is this something that you would pursue? I think we've had this conversation this evening, so thank you very much. Um, so I stated this earlier with the parent group. Um, in a world where money was no object, if, if funding and money was not an object, I can tell you that I would 100% support the idea that we would be able to offer free full day kindergarten for all of our students in Beverly. Um, the reality of that um, is that that's, that's not the situation that we face, that we have uh, much greater challenges in front of us. We've been working together for the last three years, rumbling about this as a problem um, and, and trying to figure out a way to make that happen. Um, in Beverly, it's a, the, a, a there's a couple of challenges around full day kindergarten. Um, one of them is that um, to get where we want to be, we have to take a look at the competing priorities and competing other, other obstacles that are in our way and how do we balance that and how do we make that happen. Um, in addition, currently we provide half day kindergarten to 37 students this year and the data when we look at the academic data that comes out of that, it's not showing that they're lacking in academic skills. What we don't have information on, however, is how, and we don't have a measure on what's the social, emotional, social competencies. How you know is that something that we find that you know if we had that data, would that swing the pendulum? You can look at research right now, and you can get answers on either side of the um, of the story. Um, do I believe that students in full day? classes are um, reaping the benefits of that the longer day and the instruction I think that they do and I think that as a community if that is the priority that we come together and we set then it's our responsibility and, and as superintendent it would be my responsibility to kind of make sure that if we have a plan we stick to that plan I, I think um, we're all looking for a little bit of guidance as to how to make that plan work um, and I don't think there's anybody that would ever say that it's not a good idea. The question is how do we get there? And how do we get there in light of the competing agendas that we have? And in a responsible way so that we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. So that wasn't a very popular answer earlier, but I'm hoping that was a more popular answer today. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and I threw Mr. Milady off. I was supposed to do a time check before his question, oh. so we're actually doing very well. Um, okay. So we can continue on with our questions. Mrs. Visnick, you're on. Thank you, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Trochik. My question is around what I feel is the most pressing need of the children in our city, the achievement gap. As I hope you know, our gap is based on socioeconomic status versus race. I've made this topic a personal priority Last summer, I took time off work to attend an accelerated week-long course at Harvard on this topic of closing the achievement gap. Over the course of the week, I listened to educators and administrators from around the world talk about the issues and solutions. My question for you is based on this topic, rooted in my personal pursuit of what I consider to be a form of social justice. What best practices have you implemented and would you implement, <clears throat> or are you aware of, that can be replicated here in order to address our achievement gap. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I think that um, we are one of our most important jobs as educators is to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of the learners in our classrooms, that we're offering an opportunity for everyone to access and, and meet the, the standards and, and mastery of, of the things that we set up to learn, to, for students to learn. Um, I think that f for me, um, the vehicle that um, would work best for us here in Beverly is our continued implementation of sort of our personalized learning and our blended learning environments. And so before I go too far on that, I wanna take a minute to explain what I mean by personalized learning because I think it's a, an, a word that gets thrown out there and is often in, out of context or uh, misunderstood <coughs> in context. So by personalized learning, I look at three things. I look at how do we differentiate our instruction within the classroom. And when you have a, a situation where there are students that have lagging skills, 
then you have to take a look at what do I need to do within the classroom to make sure that I'm meeting their needs. Um, we take a look at pacing. So pacing is how quickly are we moving through the curriculum and are we asking everybody to stop and, uh, at, and follow the exact pace of each other or are we allowing time for reinforcement of skills for students that aren't quite ready and allowing students that are ready to extend to go beyond. Um, I think a good example of the differentiated uh, learning that we have in our, our buildings right now is uh, you would have seen on your learning walks our pat this past year when we went through classrooms. So um, station rotation, flexible grouping. When you walk into our classrooms and you see students in small groups, and that's taking place both at the elementary, at the middle school, and at the high school. But teachers are, are working with small groups. They're taking a look at where students are, and they're providing reinforcements where they need to, and they're extending the learning for others where they can. That station rotation can be supplemented sometimes by some technology. So perhaps students are working in Lexia, or they're working in Read Live, or they're doing some other, using some other digital tool to reinforce some of their skills. Most important about the differentiation model is the way that we use data in order to make decisions about what we do. So we have um, a, a very strong uh, framework of data meetings that we implement. Um, beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year, where we're looking closely based on common assessments that have been either teacher created by us, formative assessments that teachers are using, or some standardized testing that we use that are common across all grade levels to make sure that students are meeting the targets that we need them to meet. And when they're not meeting those targets, what are we doing? How are we going back and making sure that we're doing some of that reinforcement? It's through those flexible groups. It's through station rotation. It's through some of the um, use of technology that we have. In terms of pacing, we take a look at how quickly are we allowing students to move through the core curriculum. So um, an example of that is, uh, if uh, is ST Math. So ST Math is an adaptive technology that allows a student to to keep going. They're not waiting for the teacher to introduce that next standard. They're able to go through. It's inquiry-based. They work through it themselves. They're able to do that. Um, it's project-based learning. When we have uh, opportunity to create project-based learning experiences for students, we, we have a, a, the ability to kind of take a deep look. What are the core knowledge skills and how are we making sure that students have access to learning them on their own as they go through? We utilize design thinking to make sure that that happens. Um, really the best way to close the achievement gap is to set high expectations and to deliver a rigorous and deep curriculum to all students. And I think our work with personalized learning, our work with blended learning, our work that we're doing around project-based learning, those are all um, areas that, that, we're, that we're utilizing in our classrooms right now in, at in attention to the achievement gap, but also in attention to just really good instruction in our classroom for all students. Mayor Cahill. Thank you, Madam President. Dr. Chirochik, um, given the opportunity to lead the Beverly Public Schools, how would you ensure consistency of instruction throughout the district? Said another way, instruction that reliably and effectively delivers the district's curriculum. I think that um, I think what you're alluding to is sort of uh, what a lot of people would term as curriculum alignment, right? Making sure that what we're delivering for instruction is consistent and coherent across all of our schools and, and in a vertical alignment from pre-K through 12. Um, so I think that's a, a really important distinction. We look sort of at three things when we talk about that. Um, the first one is that coherence. So how are we making sure that from grade to grade there's consistency as to what we learn? Well, first of all, the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks are really the, the driving document that we use. Um, we are a standards-based district. We, in, our instruction is based on the standards that are outlined there. We spend time in teacher groups and with teachers unpacking standards, trying to make use, utilizing backwards design to make sure that we identify what do the students need to know, how will we know when they know it, and how are we going to help them to get there, and what happens if they don't know it. So those are all really important factors. Um, I think that curriculum alignment, while um, from the district level, it's really important to um, kind of assess the landscape. 
the real work happens at the building level, and uh, we have our instructional leaders in our building. Our principals are our lead learners in our buildings, and they are the one with the responsibility around instructional leadership. So they're the ones that are guiding their, their teams, whether it's content teams, whether it's grade level teams, making sure that the curriculum, that the teachers have high quality materials at the ready that they need and making sure that there's a consistent implementation. And, they, and, in our, and in Beverly, our five elementary principals work together to make sure that across our schools, we're doing the same thing. So fourth grade uh, writing at one school is, is measured on the same rubric as fourth grade writing at another school, or our, our common assessments in math. If we're expecting mastery of certain standards by this point in the year in one grade level, we're expecting it across all of our schools. And we use common assessments in our schools to make sure that we do that. But there's another piece of that that is really important, and that's really kind of aligning the tiers of curriculum. So making sure that you have a really strong core program and that you identify what that strong core tier one program is. Because if you don't have a strong core program, you have a difficult time reinforcing skills on one end or extending skills on the other. So that's at the heart of it. And then what happens when kids aren't aren't learning what we're, what we're asking them to learn, and that's when we evolve into our tier two instruction. And that's not special education, that's, that really is going back and reintroducing either in a different way, utilizing the strategies of universal design for learning. So, you know, how, what level, how are we engaging students in the content? Are we, are we going at it in a way that they, they're engaged and that they're interested in what they're learning? How are we representing it? Are we using multiple means of representation to make sure that students are, are getting it coming in a way that they can comprehend it. And then finally, multiple means of expression. How do we make sure that they have the ability to show us where they are and what they know and what they need to learn? Um, and again, back to sort of that assessing of the landscape, in the last eight years, we've had uh, re, re uh, visions to our English language arts standards twice. We've had revisions to our math standards twice. We've had a new set of next gen science standards issued. We have a new set of digital literacy and computer science standards that have been issued. And now this year, uh, implementation of fall of 2019, we have a new set of social studies standard. And that new set of social studies standards has caused us to revisit our scope and sequence. Eighth grade is now teaching civics, not uh, world, world history, which is what they had been doing. And in our high school, Mrs. Taylor just recently presented to curriculum and instruction a revision of our scope and sequence for U.S. history and world history so as to make sure that we're getting to the standards that we need to get um, in a timely manner. So those are all pieces that, that are ongoing. It's, an on it's, it's a very big job, but it's an ongoing job, and it, it's what we're doing constantly. So revisiting and making sure that the, the curricula that we have in place matches the standards and frameworks that we're asked to follow. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I'm next again. Um, so one of the important characteristics or aspects of a successful relationship between the superintendent and the school committee, and how do you plan to keep the school committee informed? Mm, that's a good one. Had to have one of those. You had to have one of those. Um, I think the most important aspects of any relationship, whether it's superintendent and leadership, superintendent and parents, or superintendent and school committee is really trust. I think it comes down to, uh, this is your decision, you all are sitting here, you're gonna make the decision about who this superintendent is gonna be, and, and I hope that whatever decision you make, you're making it because you trust that the person that you're choosing is gonna make decisions aligned with the vision and goals that you all have for our education in Beverly, for our students in Beverly. Um, I think vice versa, it's really important for the superintendent to understand that every single one of you come to the table with good intentions. Nobody just signs up to be a school committee member without good intentions or, or, or to not help the students in our district, that's why we're here. I think always leaving at the center of everything that we do, the idea that what we're here for is to make sure that we're providing the best education we can for the students, for the citizens of Beverly, right? That's, our, that's why we're here. Um, I, think communica I think you'll find in me, it's pretty hard for me to be anything but 
kind of pretty much out there with my communication. And I, you kind of can know what I'm thinking when you're talking to me. I kind of wear it on my face. Um, but I think that honesty and openness is a really important part um, of what we do. Um, I think that um, one of the roles of the superintendent in some part is to provide professional development in a in a different way for school committee. Um, I think through our curriculum and instruction committee, that's been sort of a goal for me, is, is not only just to have, to bring forward the topics that we're talking about, but to provide insights for school committee as to how we're doing that so that you understand. And the best way I've found to do that is to bring teachers in front of the school committee and the curriculum instruction and say, have at it, show us what you do, and let you have qu ask questions of them of how, why did they choose that? How does that work? What is, you know what are the challenges it gives you insights as to the challenges that our teachers are facing in the classroom as well as insights to things that we should really be celebrating about the the amazing work that our teachers do all the time um, I think for for me in the same way it would as a superintendent it would be the same thing how how is leadership feeling and how did they come up with that list of priorities and what are their needs and what do we need to do to support them in the classrooms um, I think that that is important um, I am a, uh, they'll, they'll all tell you that I am a huge memo person. I have a, I've written a uh, Sunday memo for the last 16 years. It goes out faithfully. Um, and it, it, it really is how I pass on information. Um, anything that can be put in a memo should be put in a memo. I don't like to take the time of our leadership and pull them out of their buildings to talk about things. I think that anything that can be communicated that way. Um, I hope that you would find me to be approachable and open and you would ask me any question that you would want answered and that I, that you would trust that my answers were honest and um, you know coming from a place to help you understand better a, a situation or a concern or an issue that we face. Um, I know Steve does his Friday update. I don't know if you like that. I think we could have a conversation about what's the best way to communicate and how do you like to receive your information. Um, but I think that would be pretty much at the heart of it. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Abel. Thank you. Dr. Chirochek, as superintendent, what steps would you take to get to know our community and to become an approachable, engaging, and visible leader in our city? That's an interesting question because I know, um, you know, I think on the on the surface, it's you know, some would say, oh, she's been here forever. She should know all of these things. She knows everybody. Everybody knows her. Um, but it's a different lens that you look at things through. Um, I get a lot of advice from people who have been in a superintendent role, who have, in in particular, who have assumed a superintendency in a district that they've been a career educator like I have. Um, and the first thing they say is, pretend you're not. Pretend you haven't been there for 23 years. You know, put t d draft your entry plan, go about your interviews, talk to people, engage in conversations with stakeholders in a way as if you don't know anything because the things that you might uncover as you go along might surprise you. Um, so I think that's really um, an important aspect of, of how I would approach it. Um, I think it's it's really interesting for me. So I I, I think I, I was talking with someone this morning. I've talked to so many people today, so I don't remember who I've said what to. But I was talking to someone this morning. They said, "Well, what's going to be different about being the superintendent instead of the assistant superintendent?" And and I think a big piece for me, I equate it to, um, I think being a superintendent is going to be more like being a principal, right? So in the, as a principal, I was sort of the mini CEO of my building. And anyone that knew me then knows I kind of took that seriously. I thought I was my own little boss, um, but I. I had this, the weight and the responsibility of the well-being of the students that were in my care while they were sitting in front of me. And as the assistant superintendent, I've sort of taken a step back from that. It's not like I'm, I'm not responsible, but I don't have that day-to-day -day responsibility. And I think going into a superintendency, you're kind of putting that back on, right? You're back to these 4,500 students for whom you're the district leader, and, and, they, and the parents entrust them into your care throughout the school day. And so that's a different level of responsibility um, that, that we take on. Um, so I think going into that role, I kind of have to retool and rethink about, about everything. I might have, my opinions might shift just a little 
when I have to think about it in that lens instead of the lens of, oh, well, if you really have a problem, you can check in with Steve because <laughs> he's still there and, <laughs> and off you go. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's a, an entirely different lens and a different set of responsibilities. So um, I, I'm aware of that. I think um, I'm excited about the opportunity. I, even today, as I toured the buildings, I was in a different role I was the candidate, right? I was walking into classrooms and Mrs. Taylor was introducing me and do you have anything you want to say to Dr. Trochek? And that was very different from when I'm just coming in and sitting down next to you and saying, what are you working on today? So uh, the role changes and it shifts and the lens changes. So um, I think that would be the biggest, the biggest differences that I would see. Okay. And this, are, oops, sorry. Well, I'm sorry, I, I think the second part of it is um, how about visibility as our educational leader? Thank you. Yes, I forgot about So um, there's a lot of layers to visibility. There's visibility in the community. Um, there's the, um, the obligation to engage with stakeholders, not necessarily just the parent community, right? There are community partners that we want to forge partnerships with. Um, we have partnerships right now with Endicott and with Salem State. And, you know, I see opportunities for us to tap into some other resources that might be out there. Um, we've, we talked recently uh, Betty and I about our internship program and how could we strengthen that and what community partners might we need if we wanted to be able to do that and what if we were thinking about expeditionary learning in some of the earlier grades how would we need partnerships to do that so I think as a superintendent um, it's it's sort of incumbent upon me to kind of make those connections um, celebrate what's going on in our schools let people know how great we are and that you know we're, we would love to work with them and have them be part of what we do um, I think within the schools visibility comes down to um, being in classrooms and being available and being um, there I spend a lot of times in the buildings right now um, three hours at a time walking through classrooms talking about instruction reflecting with the administrators um, that's something that I would not change no matter what role I was in. Whenever I'm, um, whenever I get to a certain point in the day, I might get in my car and show up over at one of the elementary schools and just sit in a kindergarten room for a little while. Because we always have to remember that what we do and why we're here is to provide an education for the students that are in our schools. And, and um, they, our stakeholders, as well as parents or stakeholders, as well as uh, the school committee, as well as community members, and, and the businesses that are around us. So, so being available and being part of all of that is really important. In terms of other things, I mean, games, I love games. Shows, I'm always at shows. And I think those are, for me, that's not part of the job. Those are the celebrations. That's where we really see our students' passions coming out. That's where we're able to kind of connect with families and celebrate their child as they're <coughs> performing or as they're doing something like that. So, um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Goodwin. Thank you. Um, Dr. Trochuk, in your opinion, what is the most effective way to use technology in a school district like Beverly? Mm. I think that um, that's a really important question. I think um, we are so fortunate in Beverly to have access to the technology as readily and um, and easily, and, and I have a strong respect for our ability to access that. that. That's an amazing feat that other districts are still trying to figure out. So when I talk about us being four, uh, you know, forerunners in the field of education, we, we, we took that on a long time ago, and our work right now at the high school and at the middle school and in our elementary schools shows that. So we don't have we're not we don't have the same worries that other districts have about how to provide the infrastructure in our schools or what kind of devices we have the we have those at the ready. Um, I think the most important thing that we have to remember is that technology isn't something that we teach. Technology is a tool that we use for teaching, right? And and our Children, whether we like it or not, are digital natives, and they always will be digital natives, and technology is not going anywhere. So our, it's our responsibility to uh, teach them how to use it, how to use it safely, how to use it effectively, how to use it respectfully, um, so that it can be a tool that's effective that we use in the classroom. 
um, it's a big challenge. It's a, it's a learning curve for all of us. We have teachers that are in classrooms that may tell you they didn't sign up for this, right? They didn't, they, they didn't have a computer in front of them when they were in school. So it's a whole new way of learning how to teach, and that's part of our responsibility, and I think that falls under technology. We are so fortunate to have Judy Miller in our district. Judy has really taken the lead for us in how we can um, improve and provide professional development for our teachers in how to use it and how to use it well. Um, we are... Um, I think we have shifted. I, I think teachers uh, understand that technology isn't something that you do. Technology is a tool that you use. And when they're designing their lessons now, they're looking at where do we incorporate this use of technology? What's the right way to use it? What's the right tool to use as we do that? Um, unless you walk through the hallways and see the second graders doing green screens at the Hannah School in the hallway, directing their own work, creating their own um, creations, understanding how to use it, well, with the exception of taping the script on the iPad holder. But they, they, use, they use it creatively. They know what they're doing. Um, you know, it, it's part of, of, of their world. It may not have been part of our world. And I think it's, it's funny that we keep asking the question, where does technology fit? Well, technology's here, and it's our responsibility to make sure that we understand what it is, that we know how to use it, and that we understand that we have to explicitly teach our students how to be safe, how to be responsible, how to be what is how to be polite <laughs> you know I mean using technology is very different and and there are norms around what you can and should and would do on social media there are norms about how you could and should draft an email but these are all skills that they're gonna have to have and so it's our job to create a program and a curriculum that cultivates that in them as they go forward uh, all right, thank you I'd also like to take another look at this from the parents point of view who often worry about too much screen time and can you explain what you would tell a parent about the use of technology in the schools and how they might be able to balance that in the child's life mm -hmm. um i have i can i can offer two different answers if that's possible of course uh, first i'm going to talk about screen time in the elementary schools um, we do not have a one-to-one -one, um uh, environment in our elementary schools we have devices that are um are, are sent out to classrooms in it, it, proportionally, right? So perhaps maybe 12 devices to 24 students, whatever that proportion is. And some of Chromebooks and some are, are iPads. And I um, emphatically believe that in our elementary classrooms, those devices are only on when the teacher assigns them to be on and they're only on they're, they're, they're addressing a particular skill, standard, or topic that the teachers want the student to be working on. So I think we have very strong controls over those and how they're used. Um, the high school has had their one-to-one -one laptop for quite a while. Um, I think there's room for improvement, perhaps, about um, helping, still helping teachers understand when and where to use it, but I think they have a, a really good handle on it as a tool, and I think that uh, so much of our curriculum and our assessments and our um, environment is built around how to utilize those um, devices. I think our real challenge, our real area, area of opportunity, let's call it, area of growth, will be at the middle school where all of a sudden we opened up on August 29th with 1,410 iPads in our building. That's a big change from a building that couldn't get on a Chromebook last year to a building that now has so much technology at the ready. There's a learning curve that we have to address. Um, there's a lot of debate and discussion, and, and I sat through two meetings last week, that's three, two meetings last week um, with the administration here at the middle school, Dr. Hershey, the director of IT, about the pendulum swing that has happened. So six years ago, you couldn't get on YouTube in any of our buildings. It was a closed infrastructure. There was The internet was closed. You, you could not get on anything. That was interrupting instruction, and at the request of administer, administrators and, and teachers, we sort of flipped the pendulum the other way, and now it's sort of wide open. And, and, and I believe, personally, that there's some place in the middle that we can rest, that we can find, where we're a little more structured and a little more restrictive around what we can access, but we're not preventing or, 
or uh, uh, teachers from utilizing and accessing the tools. What was happening before is you'd set your lesson up and you'd go to turn it on and you couldn't get on YouTube, and you had to make a phone call so someone could open that site. And the sites are so challenging because, you know, um, in order to get on this, you have to be able to access this. So, so that was a problem. However, now we're getting requests, can you turn off this, can you turn off this, can you turn off that? It's a great solution, except for I, 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 I truly believe that as soon as we shut off this game, they're going to find another game, right? And so, it, and then if we turn off that one, they're going to find another one. So there's a there's a balance between what we really need to be doing is a better job of patrolling and holding students accountable within the classrooms and within the hallways, and that's an evolution that I think is happening. Um, and and I think setting down some real strict expectations about that. Um, in terms of FaceTime in the elementary schools. That students in I, I I would be surprised if FaceTime in an elementary school exceeds an hour total for the day, and that's built in that there's a 15 or 20 minute block where most students are accessing Alexia in K12, which is a wonderful learning program, and and the 20 minutes that they're accessing ST Math, which is yet an, which, which is also a, a very rich and, and wonderful program. If they're doing anything more than that, either at an indoor recess or within the classroom, it's exploring some of the green screen opportunities and videotaping each other as they read book reports out loud or as they give weather reports or news reports. Um, when they're on Seesaw within the classroom, Seesaw is, it, it's, a, it's, it's not an open internet for them. They're not scrolling around. They're utilizing one thing and doing one thing within that app. So um, I, I, in terms of elementary, I think that's, uh, uh, an easy answer. In terms of middle school, I think our middle school teachers are, are really um, getting better every day at the use of their Apple Classroom and at, at defining when students should be using iPads and when they shouldn't. Um, I do think it's a work in progress, um, but I do think it's, I, I would want everyone to know that it's definitely on the minds of the administrators, the minds of the teachers, and the minds of the central office, so. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, Mrs. Ferretti. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to say this is the last question, but we're very close. <laughs> uh, how would you evaluate the administrative staff that are both direct reports to you and um, staff beyond that? And the second part to that would be how would you address any uh, staff member that their uh, performance just isn't quite meeting the standards that it needs to to meet, and how would you deal with that? So um, in terms of evaluating administrators, um, uh, Mr. Milady mentioned earlier a 360 model. Um, I, I don't know that that is uh, a formal procedure that we wouldn't put in place, but I do think that reciprocal feedback is a really good idea when you're when you're evaluating uh, people, especially at the level of administrators. Um, I uh, we've actually had a few conversations about that back and forth about what that might look like in Beverly. Um, I think evaluation is really important because. Personally, I think it's the most wonderful opportunity that you have to sit face to face and to talk directly with people that you're working with and to talk about and identify areas of celebration and things that they're doing great, to, to steal, borrow their brilliance, as some of them call it, and share it with others, to have reflective conversations about what their needs are and understand what supports they might feel like they need in the building. That's how I approached evaluation as a principal of teachers. That's, I mean, I think I would have a very similar model of doing that. Um, I think I'm, I actually am a, a pretty much of a stickler around um, timelines around that. I think uh, feedback is important to be given in a timely manner. And I think, um, I think that's something that um, as superintendent, people would find um, a priority for me in terms of how I do that. Um, um, I think that my, uh, our role as a leadership team is to support each other, but I think that the work that building principals do in their own buildings, evaluating their staff, is really important. Um, and how, however I could support them, whether it's modeling for them, whether it's making sure they understand the procedure, um, I'm, I'm, 
I, I love doing walkthroughs with people and then having reflective conversations about what we saw and sharing what I might share for feedback for someone that I would that that you know in that process. Um, I think that an untapped area of evaluation, and I, I don't know where it would go, but it's something that I've always been interested in is um, building in more self-reflection for our teachers and for our administrators. So what do you think is going well in your classroom? What do you think you need more support in? How can I provide that for you? Um, I think there's a place for that and I don't I, I think that's an untapped opportunity that we have in Beverly to kind of explore that a little bit more. Um, in terms of someone that was uh, was, was not managing to be meeting the standards that we feel are important for that. Um, I think that there are, uh, the real question is to, to look at why. So you have to really uncover what is it that's getting in the way. And is it, is, is, you know, before you pass a judgment on why something is the certain way that it is, what's behind it? What are, what are the causes? What supports maybe have they not been given? What training might they need? How can we work to help them improve? Is there something they're not understanding about the values or the, the expectations that we have? Do they need some modeling? Um, I'm a proponent of providing coaching for people who are struggling. Um, um, I think all of those things are important. In the end, I think it falls upon the building principal or the superintendent to make a decision if, if in fact, this is the right fit for somebody or, or not. I mean, those are never easy uh, conversations and they never entered into lightly, but, um, you know, I think we, we, need to, we need to think about that. We are creating a, uh, a very deep and robust educational system here, and, and we've had a lot of conversations. What are we doing for our first and second year teachers? Because this is not an easy place to teach, not because you don't have what you need, but because we expect so much of you. And we, ha we, are, we are complex in the way that we're delivering instruction, and we're asking teachers to do a lot. Um, that's why the fellow program works well for us. They're in here for a year. They're able to see what we do and how we operate. Um, but it, it's a real challenge to walk in as a first or a second year teacher or even a, a teacher with more years into a system because we, um, we do have very high expectations for our teachers and what we ask them to do. So um, those are Great. just some of my ideas. Thank you, Dr. Trotek. I appreciate the thoroughness. Okay, so. I get to wrap it up with two, two, two questions. Um, first, thank you again for being with us today and spending this amount of time in our district and sharing your professional experience with us and your approaches to educational leadership. So at this time, do you have questions for us? And um, after that, would you like to leave us with a closing statement? So I do have a question. I got to, I've got, have had questions asked of me all day and often there's a common thread and it's sort of um, what do you see as our greatest strengths and, and what if you if you were going to change something what would you like to see us do better so I guess I'm wondering about from you guys what do you see anyone that wants to answer what do you see as our greatest strength and what do you think that we need to work on to do better okay Mrs. Freddy. Uh, all right. Um, I, I said this last night, and I'll say it again. I, I think by far our greatest strengths are our educators, our teachers, our administrative staff. Um, they're the stars of the show as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the greatest strengths and what we could do better. Uh, probably kind of touch upon what you had said in, as far as teaching, uh, to use technology in a more responsible way. Um, as a, a parent of some middle schoolers, you know, my daughter handles it different than my son, and, uh, and you know, it, it could be better. Um, and I certainly take ownership as a parent for that, too, and I think that working with parents to let them know that, that some of the, the burden falls on their shoulders as well to teach that and uh, kind of partner with the schools and making sure our kids understand the responsibility and, and the magnitude of, of what technology, the good and the bad and the ugly. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Mrs. Abel. Sure, so um, with two children that are customers for the district, I think that we provide engaging classrooms in a place that they want to go each day. I think that we also provide a lot of opportunities, um, either right now elementary music, strings and band, <laughs> keep us quite busy. Um, 
Something that I think we can do better, I think communication has been an area as a consumer um, and uh, in, in my seat as a school committee member, I often do have information that it would be like, oh yeah, it would be great if the building or the district would broadcast that across multiple channels, not just Twitter or Facebook. Mm -hmm. A lot of our community select out of that or don't have access to those internet communications and I think that there is still value in backpack mail at the elementary level and that there's other opportunities to think about ways to get information out. Um, I know, you know, WBZ is the place that people go to find out about snow days. I wish people had that much enthusiasm to seek out information that maybe they're missing um, for other topics. But I think if we could establish multiple channels of communication to make sure we, we reach parents and, and celebrate some of our successes or you know talk about some of the work the district is working on to address, I think it would, would reap benefits. So. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Goodwin. Um, so for me, um, there was a singular event last year that kind of sums up um, what I've enjoyed in the, on what we do and what we're responsible for, and also on the other end um, kind of uh, made me a little sad. So at the graduation for the high school last year when Principal Taylor got up and she asked all the students who played a sport to stand up, and you saw how many people stood up, how many people were involved with DECA, how many people were robotics club, how many people or in a musical or a play, um, and you just saw all the plethora of opportunities that we provide the students, whether it's in the classroom or extracurricular activities, and um, having um, two um, sons who go through many, many of those, um, I can see how that adds to the education. Um, and that made me very proud that we had so many students that were taking advantage of that and um, enhancing their academic experience through that. But then I, was uh, very cognizant of all the students who didn't stand up. And then the weight of that <laughs> um, it fell back on me and us and what we do. And, and you think of why didn't they stand up or what could we have done better to engage them more or make it an environment where they could find their niche or something that they could do to enhance their experience. Okay, thanks. Mr. Milady. So I'm going to echo a little bit what uh, Ms. Ferretti said in terms of our greatest strength. Um, in addition, I would also say that, you know, we're a community really that does care, um, whether it's, you know, our PTOs, our parent organizations, um, our building leadership, our staff. Um, we've had teachers plunge into the ocean, take spin classes, run 5Ks. Principals do the same, all to help out our students. Um, we really do give back. And in the department where I think we can do better is I think we can have the courage and the tenacity to take on tackling this kindergarten issue and join the dozens of other communities in our state that have free full day kindergarten. I think that's where we can do better and we should do better. Mrs. Visnick. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Dr. Chirochek, I, I think that um, I will do a plus one and pile on, um, but I'll explicitly call out um, not, not just our teaching staff, but our, our maintenance staff, our front office staff, the administrative office, uh, all, all those people that are behind the scenes who um, tend to do what they do and never, not necessarily ever get noticed. Um, but we, we all know that if you need something done, you dang well better know the maintenance man and the secretary <laughs> in a school. Um, my, what I think we can do better and what kind of keeps me up at night is, is the burden, uh, the amount of responsibility that we <clears throat> continue to place on all those wonderful staff members. Um, as our community continues to evolve and change, um, we do have an achievement gap. Um, and, and I don't believe that it's closing, and I believe we have higher levels of anxiety uh, in our children that are in the seats in the classrooms, or not in the seats, as the case may be, uh, because they can't sit still. And I, I, I think that we can do better providing all of our staff um, some more tools in their toolbox, um, whether that's a smaller class size or whether it's a you know, trauma-informed classroom type of training, um, in order to give them the support that they need to continue to make it so that every person at this table says that's the number one thing in our district. Okay. Mayor Cahill. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, there's so much right with our district, and we, I think we, we all agree. Um, from our strength of curriculum to how, is, as you were 
explaining earlier the way we're continually reexamining and strengthening curriculum uh, to our embrace of and effective use of technology, uh, to the professional development that we provide, <clears throat> to all our staff of all kinds, um, and the commitment they have to our kids and the, the expertise they bring and, and the hard work they give day in and day out. Um, the strength of our parent involvement and commitment in so many different ways and how they help to, to provide great, uh, great opportunities uh, beyond what, you know, what we're able to budget each year. Um, so there's a, there's all, there are all these many things that we do so well. Uh, as far as where we can do better or what we need, I don't think there's anywhere where, where we're already not doing some things that are, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, are, that are on the positive side, but there's so much that, that we, and it's a collective we, right, because this is our public school district, there's so many things that we're responsible for. Yes, kids bring so many more challenges, but we get them every day, right? They're ours to, to, to try to address and to try to do the right things with. So um, what can we do better? Um, there are so many skills that kids need. There's, uh, there's content knowledge. There are specific skills. And there's, in the, in the overarching way, the skills that help them know how to learn, mm -hmm. right? Learning how to learn for life, to adapt and, and, and move through life. That's critical, and that's, that's academic. And, and then there's this whole other piece of helping children become strong, self-loving, resilient, whole adults, mm -hmm. because Brokenness destroys lives. So, <clears throat> so the, the social, emotional, and all that comes with that mm -hmm. is as important as everything else we do. And again, it's not that we're not making great efforts and strides. It's that we all need to do better on all those fronts as, as we move ahead. Thanks for asking that yeah. question. <laughs> It, it's a similar question to one we got the other night, like Mrs. Visnick said, what keeps me up at night? And I, I believe, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't believe fully that we have so much to celebrate and so much to be proud of. And, you know, when we opened this building and I got to show my neighbors around the building and the work that we did, and it's not only this building, but then to talk to them about and in the other schools and all the other things we're doing. We have a lot of excitement happening here in Beverly. Um, people are working really hard. I can't tell you how many times I leave that curriculum and instruction meeting without, and I'm inspired by the work that people in this district do every day. And it's, it's you know, information that I wouldn't normally hear about as a parent. I wouldn't normally even hear about it as a school committee member if I didn't sit on that sub, subcommittee or I actually don't sit on it, I, I kind of sit and listen. Um, but, you know, I just think we have a lot to be proud of and we have a lot to keep moving forward. And when I think about all the layers that go into our district, there, there's just so much of it. Um, you know, the work that I've been doing around the opioid crisis and, you know, um, prevention and education, I had to pick prevention and education among all the layers of that one topic. I don't know how a superintendent, you know, pulls out I mean, it's, it's like a billion things all day, every day, you know, and it's just constant. So I believe like any organization, we can always do better. And I think hearing you talk about being reflective and um, hearing people in the curriculum meetings talk about, um, you know, learning walks and even asking us to do learning walks was very beneficial. And I think we can continue to do that sort of stuff. The thing that really keeps me up at night, and I said this the other night too, is about you know, safety in our school buildings. Um, you know, tomorrow is the anniversary of, um, you know, the Florida shooting and, um, you know, I wish we could put everybody in a bubble and say we're gonna keep them safe. And we work hard on it. We are struggling with it, like every district across the country. And, um, you know, I just believe that what we have to improve is just to keep working at what we're working on and keep moving forward. So, there I am. So, all right, well, you thank you for all sharing that. I, I appreciate that. Um, I do have a closing statement. If thank that's you. Okay. Um, so once again, thank you for the opportunity to meet with you here tonight. Um, I'd like to end our discussion with a synopsis of what I believe I have to offer you as your next district leader. 
In Beverly, I've been offered the opportunity to accrue tremendous experience in all aspects of our school system. As a teacher, as a team chairperson, as a principal, I've walked in the shoes of almost every role that we have here in Beverly. Um, along the way, I have established and I've maintained relationships on which I rely to remain grounded in the real work that goes on in our schools. I have a deep respect for our staff. We have the most dedicated professionals working for us here in Beverly, and we should never forget that. But in addition, I've worked very hard to develop my skills as a leader, both on the job and through continuing education and professional growth. I have a contemporary knowledge about the issues that we face, and I remain current on developments in education. You asked earlier why Beverly. Well, Beverly is my home. It's a wonderful city. It's a proud city. It's a compassionate city. In Beverly, we address issues head on and we protect our community and its citizens, even when it may not be a popular stance. We've weathered challenges. In my 23 years here, we faced our ups and downs with the economy and we faced some difficult situations, but always in terms of our students, we've done it with the best, the best we can to make student-centered decisions. We embrace our diversity. Just ask the students at Beverly High School. They will tell you it is our greatest strength, and they are proud to support each other regardless of their differences. And finally, I believe that the vision and goals that you have as a school committee for the students of Beverly align with my vision and goals for education. I'm passionate, I'm committed, and I'm dedicated to the students of Beverly. As a leader who has invested all of my professional life into the work that we are doing right now here in Beverly, I really want the opportunity to finish the job. Um, I appreciate your consideration for the position, and I thank you for your time here this evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Trocek. And now I would like to um, entertain a motion for a recess of the school committee meeting. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Freddy. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Milady. All those in favor? Great. Seven to zero.